me do it again, right? <clears throat> Last week we talked about new beginnings as we look at this new church year. In fact, I know that in a short time we'll be hearing from the President of the United States on a State of the Union message that it's done every year by whoever the serving president is, and so we'll have one coming up soon. I like to talk a little bit about church and vision at this time of year as well, starting last week and this week and probably even next week as I share a little bit more with you. And just looking at where we are, you know, and what God's doing and what it's going to take for us to be what God wants us to be. Part of this study, uh, that's not the sermon for today, by the way. <laughs> Part of this study has to do with, uh, I had to do a little research regarding where, where is the church even as, 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 as a whole in the world and in the culture? And uh, I pulled up an article while I was online doing some research on statistics from Church Leadership Magazine uh, called the Statistics and Reasons for the Church's Decline. And almost everywhere I looked online, looking at status and statistics and reports, and it was, it, all of them are saying the same thing. The church and the world overall, not just in America, seems to be in decline. Uh, this particular article is written by a guy named uh, Richard Krieger. I can't even pronounce it properly, but he works, this with, he works with the Francis A. Schaefer Institute of Church Leadership and Development. And in his particular studies, he did say some things that were very interesting that talk about the basic church in America. I thought it would be interesting to you. I mean, we are the church, amen? So it ought to get our attention. But the, the general idea with the article had to do, why, why are so many churches just completely failing? Uh, here's a synopsis of what he said. He said, God's marvelous church has become culturally irrelevant and even distanced from its prime purpose, the purpose of knowing God, growing in Him, worshiping Him by making disciples. So this is evidenced by what is going on in our culture and in our church. Most of the statistics tell us that nearly 50% of Americans have no church home. Let me say that again. Half the people in the country don't relate to a church on any level. In 1980, they said the membership in the church had dropped by 10%. Again, 10 years later, in the 90s, it worsened by another, another 12% drop. In fact, that year, some denominations reported a 40% drop in their membership. And now, over halfway through the first decade of the 21st century, we're seeing those figures drop even more. He says America, instead of being number one, America now ranks third following China and India in the number of people who are professing Christians. In other words, the United States of America has become or is becoming an ever-increasing unreached people group. Who would have thought? Half the churches in America did not add any new members to their ranks in the last two years. That's phenomenal. Now, of course, they talked about the statistics a little bit more as so they went on down it and basically said that how many people are frequently attending church, and frequently means usually a couple of times a month. That's not what you call real regular. But it says 22% of Americans frequently attended church in 1992. 20% of Americans frequently attended church in 95. 19% of Americans frequently attended church in 99. By the way, you notice the numbers going down each year. In 2002, 18% of Americans frequently attended church in 2002. So if you extrapolate all these statistics, you add in some hope for revival. He says that by the time we reach 2025, which isn't that far away, you'll see the figures drop down to only about 15% of Americans will be frequent attenders to church. At that same rate, a further drop of 11 or 12% by another 20, 25% by 2050. So what is going on in the church is major. And it ought to draw the attention not just of leaders and elders and pastors and people in, in places of, uh, that are in authority in churches, but it certainly ought to draw the, the attention of every church member. As you looked at all these statistics and all these things, one thing you kept coming up with is kind of a, a similar list of what's going on. One had to do with, well, these people watch TV and the so-called evangelist on TV who live such posh, lavish lifestyles, preaching a message on prosperity, certainly doesn't relate to the average person in the world, and it's delusion to a lot of people. Another point was the fact that there are a lot of people who've left church because they were disillusioned or they were hurt or somebody offended them in that church, and so those people are not back in church. The most outstanding one of all the surveys that I looked at always listed hypocrisy. It's the number one reason my churches are declining. The people in church are coming into church and sitting there, 
amening all the things that are being said and preached and the standards and rules or processes or whatever that are being presented within churches, but yet they go out and they live a completely different kind of life that's really not even relevant, and people see the hypocrisy in their life. Another thing that was interesting that caught my eyes is that when someone does leave a church, and this happens some people, times they, they leave a church just by just slowly going out. They, something happens, there's a sickness, there's an illness, or they get offended with somebody so they don't come for a Sunday or two. All these studies kind of pointed to the same thing, that when the average person leaves a church, there's only about four weeks to eight weeks that you can reach them in to get them back in church. And if you don't reach them within four to eight weeks, then they're usually just gone and out of church all completely. Now, you say there's this small statistic of number of people that are coming to church frequently, and then you add that to the Barner survey that came out, I think I've shared before, that says only about 50% of the people who attend church frequently are even born-again believers, identify themselves as what we would call born-again Christians. So that shows you something, a bit of a, another startling statistic. Obviously, 50% of the people who are attending are not really committed to Christ. They're not going to see any real change in, in those people's hearts. This particular guy said he, he gets back to the place where he believes it's that too many churches are not teaching the Word of God. And I think that's true. They're not preaching the truth of the Word of God. And they're not making the Word of God relevant to where people are and how God really wants to be involved in people's lives, how God really wants to touch their lives and move in their lives. And since, since the Word of God's not relevant or, or it's just absolutely boring, you know, God delivers some boring, Amen. Then because, for that reason, a lot of people don't come. So there was a lot of ex excuses, but one thing caught my, was this last sentence. He said, so we need to understand the main reason most churches don't grow is because they just don't want to grow. They're just happy. They're content where, where they at. The church has little desire for change. They're complacent, and many tend not to take their pastors seriously. And I think that's true. I think all too often we just come in and hear the messages, but that really taken into our life, or we sit back in comparison and say, well, I'm not as bad as, you know, so-and-so there. And so we're satisfied to kind of justify our, our lack of real discipleship to whatever reason. He goes on to say, true success is being obedient to what God has called us to do and realizing that although we are responsible to serve we're not responsible for the results. Our surrender to the will of God over our will and our desires, that's what success is. We're called to focus on God and what God has called us to. We're focused to have a passion and prayer to follow through. Those are the marks of successful church leadership. In other words, it's not necessarily a responsibility to, to us to grow the church. We're to do the will of God, and out of that comes the growth. And that God honors that. But it gets down to us, you know, that we forget what we're called to, and we forget the relevance of what we're called to, and we forget the reason behind the church and what the church is really for and what the church is really all about. My announcement this morning is the church still matters, and the church still matters to God, and the church matters to us, and it matters so much if we fail to not understand how it really matters, then we're not only going to affect the church as a whole of what God could and would do in it, it affects our lives in a really negative way because we don't really see what God is up to and what God is doing. We want to kind of put it in our box and say, this is the way I think church ought to be. And boy, we're all guilty of that at times, I believe. This is the way I want to see it, and this is what it ought to do. And so to say, okay, God, what are you doing? And what is your will? And what's your passion? And how do we accomplish your will and purposes in our life? So I want to talk about this, what a relevant church looks like. According to the Word of God, and of course, the best place to go, I would believe, is not to go down and look and see some successful church numbers. I think we go back to the Bible, because that's where real success lies, because you can draw, draw a crowd without preaching the Word of God. You can talk about a lot of things, but really aren't centered on Jesus Christ and truth, and you may get numerics, but that's not real church, and that's not real church growth. So I want to do just a couple things. I have eight points I'm going to make this morning to you, and we're going to cover one or two of them a little lengthier than the others, but they will just, we'll park where God needs us to park, if we feel that, amen? And uh, someone says, you have a lot of pages of notes. I said, I don't preach all that most of the time. I just focus on what the Lord's leading us to focus on. I'm just prepared for anything. <laughs> all right, so if we need a lot, we'll have a lot, <laughs> all right? But I want to look at the Bible. I want to look at the book of Acts. And I want to look at the book of Acts because, you know, it's called, been called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. That's where we see God moving because that's the church. And literally on the day of Pentecost, that's the birth of what we call church. 
and what church is supposed to be. And that's what we want to look like. That's what we want to emulate or what we want to copy. And that's, that's where we should look to and desire to be like that particular church. So if you kind of over, just look over the, the, what's happening there. In 115 of Acts, it says, in those days, Peter stood among the believers, and the group numbered about 120. Now, this is right before the Holy Spirit comes and baptizes them into the body of Christ, and they all become one. This is right before what we would call real New Testament salvation. Yes, that Peter and the disciples were saved, but they had not yet been baptized into the body of Christ because it was just being formed because the resurrection had just taken place. And this great institution, the bride of Christ, the church, is getting ready to be birthed on the day of Pentecost. And they're going to be placed into the body, into the bride, and when the Holy Spirit brings them in. But there's only... 120 of them. That's what they number. And the Lord said, you go, you wait. And so they're being obedient. But the day of Pentecost, great things begin to happen. The message is preached. The gospel is shared. And those who accepted the message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Man, the Holy Spirit's been given now. The one who Jesus has promised. All these people have been filled and baptized by the Holy Spirit. They're in the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit, and that's 3,000 people. I mean, up, you know, we're adding now. Most of all, most people say that's really just the number of men. But men, women, children, whatever, that's still 3,000 people. All right? What makes you a New Testament church ultimately is that you're reaching people. And people's lives are being changed. Now, if you follow the story through in verse 47, it says they were praising God. They enjoyed the favor of the people, and the Lord added to their number daily. So here it goes. If you had your Bible open, all right, if you're following along, highlight your iPhone or whatever, that word daily. It's not just on Sunday. People's lives are being affected by these people's lives who've been changed. They're going out, it says, house to house, door to door. Things are happening. So the church is growing, and things are happening. I mean, that, that means at least 365 people, if it's daily, at least one a day gets saved. That's 365 people out of this crowd that are, that are being added to their number every day. So you look at those numbers from 120 to 3,000 to 3,000, minimum 3,365. If you go into Acts chapter 4, it says, because many heard the message, they believed, and the number of men grew to be 5,000. All right? 5,000 men saved. I don't know if that excites you. That excites me. How about you men? (laughs) That'll stir your heart. Can you imagine being in a group, 5,000 spirit-filled, godly, holy men, loving Jesus, winning souls, talking about Christ, sharing the Word? I'm going to take a nap if y'all don't wake up. (laughs) What a moment, all right? So we're talking. If that's men, that means there's probably 15,000, 20,000 others because you can't get the women and the children, all those that have been saved. If you follow the story through in Acts chapter 5, verses 28, verse 14 said, many more women and men were added to the church. Verse 28, the Sanhedrin starts arguing with the apostles. We give you orders not to teach in his name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your children, with, with, your, with, your, with your teaching, your children, obviously, biblical children. Amen. Yeah, you guys got to shut up. The city's getting saved. This has got to stop. They have filled the entire city with the Word of God. Because, why, they're just going out every day talking about Christ. I mean, you're at work. Somebody comes, hey, how you doing, Bob? I'm doing okay. Hey, do you hear about what Jesus is doing? Who? Yeah. Jesus. You haven't heard about it? No, I haven't heard about it. Well, let me tell you about it. They're in the grocery stores. They're just wherever they are, in the marketplace, in the rules, in, in just the, the engagements of life. They're out there, and boom, everywhere they go, somebody's coming to know, the, and the Word of God's being preached. Acts 6, 1, in those days, the number of disciples was increasing. Acts 5, 14 says, nevertheless, more and more men were, were, uh, and women believed in the, and, in the Lord, and they were added to their number. I mean, this is the message you keep seeing in the first five or six chapters. It's just people coming in. We've gone from adding people now to multiplying people. You know, verse 5, 14, went back to it, it said, and more and more and more. Acts 6, 7, so the word of God spread, and the number of disciples increased in Jerusalem rapidly. What, what should we know about a church? It's, it's reaching people. Lives are being changed. In fact, it says a large number of priests came to faith. These Jewish priests who used to be so anti-Jesus and anti-Christ, they're becoming believers. And you see this growth rate starts picking up with a speed, and it's kind of like a snowball coming down the mountain. It just keeps getting larger and larger and larger. Now, I wish I had time to take you through the whole book that quickly. That's just about six or seven, eight chapters, but we're seeing something that God is doing. About 25 years later on the calendar is Acts 20, 120. 
Now, this is history kind of being laid out to us. And so now he's taken the church those first 25 years after Pentecost. And it says, and when they heard this, they praised God and said to Paul, you see, my brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed? B.H. Carroll, founder of a seminary and a scholar and written in his commentary, he estimates that by this time, this 25 years into the church here, that they had probably 100,000 members in Jerusalem church. 100,000. Peter Wagner agrees with G. Campbell Morgan. They said, well, they believe that the minimum number would probably be 60,000. 100,000. Now, if you look at the history, you'll, you'll discover that at that time, the whole city of population of Jerusalem was only, you know, 200,000 people. So half the city's gotten saved. <laughs> Amen? Half the city's gotten saved because these people are having church. Amen. They're doing church. They're being church. They're living church. They're excited about Jesus. They're excited about God. Out of these things, I want to extrapolate some, a few things that I think, as I said, eight things I think that will help us to, to, as we look into this year, what we need to do. One, we have to depend upon the Holy Spirit. This whole thing began with the, God's people being filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't leave Jerusalem. Wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. And John baptized them with water, but in a few days, I'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not going to get into this theological debate about the Holy Spirit. When do you get the Holy Spirit? My personal belief is you can't know Christ without the Spirit. You can't be born of the Spirit without the Spirit. You can't be one of God's, according to Romans 8. If you, any man has not the Spirit, he's none of his. So that I believe that the baptism of the Spirit takes place when a person comes to Christ, that they're brought into this new covenant relationship with God, and they're put into the body of Christ. It doesn't happen later. And they're baptized, literally, the Bible says. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, makes it clear to them. Says, he said, each one of you were baptized into the body. He's talking to the believers. Each one of you believers have been baptized in the body of Christ. So when you come to Christ, there's a baptism that takes place. Now, don't get confused. This doesn't mean that they were necessarily filled with the Holy Spirit. Those are two different things. It's one thing to be baptized, which every child of God, if you study the Scriptures, you break it down carefully, and you look at what Jesus is talking about, a lot of people confuse it because they, they think it's an act of the Holy Spirit. It's not. The Holy Spirit is not the baptizer. It's popular terminology, baptism of the Holy Spirit. You don't see it in the Bible. It's the baptism of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the baptizer. The means which he uses is the Holy Spirit. Everybody is put into the body of Christ. You won't be saved unless you're put in the body of Christ. You can't be put in the body of Christ without being baptized in the body. Jesus baptizes you by the means of the Holy Spirit. Now you're sealed into the day of redemption because of that baptism. Romans 6, you've been buried with Christ and raised in this new life, all right? So you have this new resurrected life. Water baptism is a simple picture of what happens when we get saved, when we're placed in Christ and we become a new person. But unfortunately... Most people, even those who claim the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for them and it's their experience and it's only for some who have had the faith to believe for it, even though many of those people aren't even filled with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit, the Bible says, you know, don't be drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit. And it talks about it on a, on a regular basis. In fact, the, the Greek wording and the verb breaks down is, is a present active. And it's all, in other words, always be being filled with the Holy Spirit. That today... I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And me being filled with the Holy Spirit today is not going to help me tomorrow. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit tomorrow. And the word filled relates back to the word drunk, which means come under the influence. Let the Holy Spirit today influence my life. Surrender today to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Give my heart completely over to Christ for this day, for this, for this service, and for this ministry called today. How do you want to use me today, God? I avail myself to you. I surrender to you. I'm not reserving it for myself. Joe's not president. Jesus is president. Hallelujah. And because Jesus is the president and the Holy Spirit's resident, I can be what God's called me to be. So I'm surrendering in my absolute dependence. And it has to be with the church. Any church that gets sufficient in themselves and think, well, we just need to have church. We, do it. we really don't pray. We don't seek God's face. We don't really pray in daily, individually, or corporately to be filled with the Spirit. We're going to miss the mark. One thing this, this church would not even get off the ground had not been for the work of the Holy Spirit that was taking place in him. And we ourselves as a church and as individuals, we must rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. I fully believe some folks are just one-third atheist. They talk about God the Father. They talk about Jesus Christ the Son and never any mention of the Holy Spirit. But I know on the other hand, there's some folks, all they talk about, they're two-thirds atheists, all right? All they talk about the Holy Spirit. We've got to come back to the balance of the Word of God. 
What is the Bible saying to us? Well, no matter what you believe theologically, you better believe you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit today. You know why? We leak. <laughs> About the guy, the little lady came to the altar and she's praying, Lord, fill me, Lord, fill me. Preacher said, don't do it, Lord, she leaks. <laughs> we all leak. We all have a tendency to leave God during the day at some point in time and to move to the realm of self-sufficiency and our own self-strength and our own self-thinking. And that's when we usually get in trouble, wouldn't you agree? So we trust God. And he said, the Holy Spirit will give him. And he said, when you receive the Holy Spirit, what will happen? Very clearly, in every instance, You'll be my witnesses. They spake the word of God with boldness. Go look at every event. Every event, you see these people preaching, the gospel's being shared, there's boldness, there's ministry, and there's lives being changed. We need to be spirit-filled people, spirit-filled members of the church if we're going to be good members of the church, spirit-filled, spirit-controlled people. Realize just how important Jesus is in our life and how we can't do anything without him. I can't preach without him. I can't husband without him. I can't dad without him. I can't be what God's called me to be without him. You need the Holy Spirit working in your life today. I need the Holy Spirit working in our life. We must have the Holy Spirit working in the church today. You say, how does that happen? Every instance in Scripture says, ask. Amen. <laughs> I won't give you a scorpion. I won't go to hand you a snake. <laughs> you ask, I'll freely give. We can trust God. So we're surrendering our church to his leadership and sur surrendering ourselves to his filling in our lives. If we're going to be what God's called us to be, or we're going to join the ranks of all those churches that are in decline, then we better trust the Holy Spirit for His grace and power in our life. The second thing is we must love people. If you follow anything through the book of Acts, you see this, continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, devoting themselves to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Wonders and signs were taking place with the apostles. All those who believed were together and had all things in common. Interesting part. That's just a little clip of that passage. If you follow the whole patches, they're, they're going into their communities, to their neighbors, to their friends, and just loving them, sharing the truth with them, sharing physical things with them. I mean, what a, what a great illustration of people just kind of stepping out of their safety zones. I don't know, people today in the world we're living in kind of like they're in a nutshell, all right, because they're nuts, all right? <laughs> And then they're safe inside their little shell. I can't really speak to anybody. I can't really talk to anybody. I'm, I might embarrass myself, and I don't want to embarrass them, and I don't want to put them on the spot, and I don't want to put me on the spot. And what if I don't do a good job at it? And what if I fail, and I don't talk real good? And it's not my personality, so I'm just going to let everybody down and go to hell. Now, we wouldn't say that. And sometimes we probably don't even think that. Why? Because we're too busy thinking about our inability in something. Our, our, our capacity. Hey, listen, this love that God's put in our heart, it is in our hearts to love Him with, but it's in our hearts to love each other with, and then to love a lost world with. We've got to love people. And if we're going to love people, we can't be stuck in our little independent ruts. And we can't sit back and judge each other and determine who's spiritual, who's not spiritual. She, she doesn't look good. Her dress is too short. His hair is too long. He doesn't smell. Hey, away with all that. Somebody else said bladder net. Amen. <laughs> we have to love people, and we love each other. We're not sitting here. God didn't call us to the judge's bench. Amen. He will, but we won't be sitting as judges. <laughs> Hallelujah. Act like God's children. One thing you discover about God's children, and I, I want you to know that usually the, the, the high testimony of believers' fellowship is you walk in that place, those people love each other, and they love visitors and guests in their church. But we've got to do that outside the church as well. Some of you folks are the lovingest folks you'll ever meet in your life. I'm serious. You guys, are, you, you're a loving fellowship. You, you are a blast to pastor. All right? I'm one of the few pastors that can actually say that, all right? You're a blast to pastor. You love God. But we have to love a lost world too. We've got to be concerned, not just in the confines of these walls and being so receptive to people, but outside, we have to love people. When people come to our church, it's usually a high testimony. And by the way, most people looking for a church room, they come in, they want to know what about the youth ministry, they want to know about the children's ministry, they want to know about that ministry. What do you do for these people? What do you, do? And, and, you know, and I tell you what, if they're met first and foremost with a real spirit of love and acceptance, they can overlook a lot of things like facilities and those kind of things and programs. I'm starting to ring up here a lot, all right? So the, the heart 
The compassion has to be genuine. It has to keep flowing from our life and just moving out. It says, as a result of this fellowship, verse 47, the Lord added to their number daily. Third point, we have to embrace the biblical model of ministry and ministry groups. The Bible says they met in the temple and they met in smaller groups as well. We talk about it all the time. We preach it all the time. We share it all the time. We, we encourage it all the time. We do everything to put lift stuff out, recognize lift group leaders, recognize me, bring to some of the best solid discipleship material we can find for lift group ministries. All right? But if you don't participate, it's not going to do you any good. Amen. Now you think, well, I haven't got time for that. What do you have time for? You got time for two or three hours every night of TV? Hello, you got time to sit on your iPhone for three or four hours at a time and Facebook and tweet and twit and all that other stuff? Not getting too close to home, am I? I hope so, because we live together here. <laughs> By the way, this is my job also, right? This is what I'm called to do, to keep us on track, hallelujah. Keep us focused, keep us the, about the, keeping the main thing the main thing. Amen. We've got time. Well, I'm tired. Who isn't? I'm tired this morning. All right? <laughs> Who isn't? But I'll tell you what, we have to invest our time in the things that God wants us to invest our time in if we're going to make a difference in the world. There's no way that all these needs of people's hearts and lives are going to be met in, in corporate worship services. And God do that. You just look how much of the New Testament you see. Even Paul where he's making references. And, and say, say thank you to the house of so-and-so and the house of so-and-so. And don't forget to add those people to the house of so-and-so and to thank God for what they're... Who are all these house people he's talking about? He's just talking about ministry groups. They're taking place. You find your life getting spiritually stale? You find your, your life getting where the Bible's just kind of not as relevant as it used to be? You find yourself kind of waning in power to be the witness that God's called you to be? It could well be you've pulled yourself out from being part of a group that will encourage you to stay faithful and be praying for you regularly and will know your needs and you'll know their needs and you can minister to one another and keep encouraging one another. That's what it's all about. In the corporate worship, we enjoy, but also in these, these smaller groups of ministry. And we have all kinds, of, and it's not just that. We've got all kinds of small group ministries that take place. If it doesn't fit your mouth, probably there's a ladies group, ma'am, that you can get a hold of and be a part of. There's probably a men's group that you can get in and, and get involved in. There's somewhere, something happening in the church body that will minister to you in a smaller way where you can be, know and be known so you can be a part of something. It's an important part of what God's doing in our church and life. We have to embrace that. The fourth thing is we must realize just how big God is. Now, it's one thing to sing how big our God is. How great is our God. That's marvelous to talk about how great our God is. Amen. But we need to practice that, believe that, and realize that. You see these people praying. The apostles have been taken prisoner, some of them, all right? They're being questioned by the Sanhedrin at this point. And they come back and say, we're in trouble. What are we going to do? It says they prayed. When they heard this, they raised their voice together in prayer and said, Sovereign Lord, you made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in it. And you spoke by your Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant David. Why did the mountain nations rage and the people imagine, uh, 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 plot in vain? The earth take their stand, rulers against the Lord and against the anointed one. What are they saying here? God, we're in trouble here. And there are people in high places and this culture that is trying to shut us down and shut us up and make us ineffective. But God, we know you're bigger than all that. Amen. Now, we're living in a similar day, not that we're being drug out and being eaten by lions in public arenas. Amen. Praise God for that. Amen. In some parts of the world, they are. Not by lions, but by sword and all the other places and yeah. deep persecution against them. But we have to come to the place and say, you know, God, we're living in this culture that certainly opposes you. We're living in a political world that opposes you. We're living in a cu cultural world that opposes you. The entertainment world opposes you. The industries of the world, for the most part, don't want you in their businesses. They don't want you in the court system. They don't want you in the school system. And we're not going to be content to go out and hide within our four walls on a Sunday. We, want, we need to continue to take the gospel to the world. So we need you, God. We need you, and we're going to trust you, and we're going to pray to you, and we're going to believe you because we are facing opposition. God, do not let us come to the place of this little hold the fort mentality 
and just kind of, well, you know, the devils, we're just going to try to hang in there till Jesus comes. Everybody get your little hankies out and worry with me. <laughs> That's not what we're going to do. Say, God, we're not going to give in to this. I mean, how many of you heard all the time, well, this culture certainly opposes God, and this culture is certainly anti-Christ, and it's, yeah, what'd you expect? It's, that's what they do. Amen. The world doesn't love God. It should not surprise us. Amen? We ought to realize, but at the same time, we also realize the power of God to overcome those things and those barriers that are out there. We ought to realize the power of God when Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Now, strategically, you understand that if you have gates, that means there's a wall. And if you have gates and a wall, they're there for de defensive purposes. So that means somebody is on the offense here, and it's not the devil. It's the church. In other words, we're taking it to the battlefields. We're taking it to the world. Our message of the gospel goes out into the public arena. And when it goes out, it is so powerful, so transformative, so life-changing, Satan's going to give up ground. And Satan hates the church that's taken territory. And Believer's Fellowship for 30-plus years has taken territory from the devil. And we are going to continue to take territory from the devil. <laughs> Hallelujah. We have to believe God and believe that he's bigger than all these things and bigger than our issues. We're trusting, we're believing every ministry that we have within our fellowship is to embrace this, this, this idea that God's bigger than any of us. We don't want to sit back and play it safe. We don't want to be afraid to, to step out. We don't want to be afraid to speak. We live our life in such a way that proves we believe that God's a big God. The fifth thing of this list is we understand and we believe in the power of prayer. That goes along with believing how big God is. If I really believe God's big, guess what? I will pray. What they do when they got in trouble. In fact, 48 times through the book of Acts, 48 times it makes reference to them praying. We must pray. We pray in our lift groups. We pray in our services. I've been, we talked about in recently and as far back as August in our staff retreat and also as Tim and I make plans for the Wednesday night services that we're going to be bringing some strategic prayer meetings into our Wednesday night services throughout the year. Things that are specifically geared to strategic needs because we are in a battle. And a battle is a, is a strategic thing if it's going to be fought and won. And there's going to be strategic prayer meetings where we have where we're praying specifically for, specifically for very specific things. We're going to be taking it to the Lord as a group. We'll have strategic prayer meeting. When you walk in this service, there'll be a time of worship and praise, and then there'll be a time to go to our knees and seek God's face. Some will be done corporately. Some will be broken into groups. Some will be broken about specific needs. If there's specific health needs, specific family needs, specific financial, you'll be able to go to a group and be prayed for by people who've walked in that arena already themselves. Amen. And you'll pray and you'll believe God. Prayer meetings are long gone in churches today. I mean, we'd hardly have time for prayer in church. And what have we come to? We pray. And I love it when Acts 4, when it says, you know, they're praying. By the way, why are they praying? They're in trouble. And they take that trouble to the Lord. Now, most of us, when we're in trouble, we say, Lord, take the trouble away. God didn't take the trouble away. It increased. They just said, God, give us strength. God, give us boldness. God, give us authority to deal with these issues. They knew what was coming. Jesus already told them it was going to be that way. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. They hated me. They ain't going to have it. Love you. <laughs> so what do we do? That's when we pray. You have needs in your family? Quit worrying about it. Start praying about it. I know some of you, Satan has so frustrated you about your prayer life because you don't think God's answering your prayers. And the reason why you think that is because you're listening to him, number one. And two, because you're using your physical eyes to look at your situation. And all you can see, it's just trouble. My kids are in trouble. My family, this is going down. It's getting worse. Hey, sometimes it has to get a lot worse before it gets better. For people to come to the place of brokenness. God's not imposing his will on people when we pray. He's imposing his will on the forces that are keeping them blind and in captivity and in bondage. So we in prayer seek God's face and the power of Jesus and the name of Jesus. And we enforce in that name and God is moving. He said, well, I haven't seen it yet. Hold on. Keep believing. Keep praying. Keep trusting. Your prayers are being heard. God is moving. We must believe and pray. And all that, with that said, let me say, 
we understand what God's called us to do. If we're going to do it, we have to continue to be generous. You look at this church, and without reading all the passages, we know what happens in Acts. They're giving away their property. They're bringing them, laying at their stuff, their money at the disciples' feet and the apostles' feet, saying, find the needs in the church and the fellowship in the community, and you meet them with this. God told me to give this. All right, these aren't people that are, you know, I know some, we have a generous fellowship, praise the Lord. But I can guarantee you, these people aren't sitting around with their iPhone on Sunday and say, let's see, I made this much this week times 10%. Okay, here's my check. Write my check out for this much. Now, other things how little they can give or what, the, or what the standard might be. These people are having hearts that are generous. I got this. I'm not using this. I'll never use this. Let's use it for the glory of God. Let's see what God will do when we just have generous hearts. And praise God. I'll speak a little bit more about some of the things that Believers Fellowship is doing more specifically this next week. But one thing I'm going to believe on Monday, and I'll be taking your generous gift to the churches of Belize. It's around $40,000. We've already given $10,000. The elders have committed a certain amount to men churches that are in need down in Belize. Some of these churches, I mean, folks, these, and I'll bring you like a more detailed report, but some of the churches we're helping are churches. Remember, they don't have, you know, churches like we have churches for the most part. Some are, and some of the few major cities that are there, they've got some nicer churches, but none of them have central air, central heat. Many of them don't have toilets in the building. One of the churches we're helping has prepared to have toilets. They've got the plumbing put in the slab. They actually have a slab now. They've got roof and walls, but they have no toilets to put on those spots where that toilets were prepared for. They have no toilets. And they've been meeting, and if you're, if you're getting down in the tropics and you know what that heat's like, and our mission groups that have been down there have been down in June know what it's like. It's like that for the most part of the year. Some of these churches don't even have fans in the ceiling. So as you're thinking about how hot or cold it might be in the building this morning, you remember <laughs> what it could really be like. But your generosity, reaching down there, ministering to people, that's one of the great signs of Believer's Fellowship. We've taught on stewardship, and we've been faithful to teach on stewardship. So many churches don't even talk about it. But when we do that and when we're faithful to God, it's amazing what God will do with generous people. This was a church in the book of Acts. These people had been blessed, and they wanted to be a blessing in return. But I think about all the ministries that take place, whether it's food pantry and clothing pantries and outreach ministry, the ministries that took place during Harvey, the thousands of dollars we gave out to, to people in need during, during Harvey experience. That's just a generous people. It's a generous church. But that can even grow farther. The more that we grow and the more that we go and be what God's called us to be, Along with that, folks, comes this number seven. We have to all continue to discover our ministry. What is your ministry? Where does God want you to plug in at? What's God, want, what's God given you a burden for? I mean, most of us could do about anything in the church, any ministry in the church. I mean, because some of you are just, you know, we've got a pretty good skill set here. You know, on some level you could do but God's really burdened you in some areas. What is it? I mean, let me put it more close like this. This may be a little bit personal, but you know me. We're just friends here, right? What are you doing now? Where are you serving right now? Well, I'm just waiting to hear from God for 30 years. <laughs> just waiting here. I'm going to find out what the Lord's saying to me. It, I think God's speaking. We just need to pay attention. Where are you called to? And why aren't you doing it? Why are you not doing it? What, what's the, well, I just really wasn't accepted or I was rejected. Hey, get over it. Get back in there. Amen. It might not have been the right moment, right time. Might not, hey, you might have even been wrong about your idea. It happens with me. I'm sure it could happen to anybody else. We, all, we, we just have to ask God to open our hearts and give us the passion that he wants to have because he has gifted us already for ministry. Find your spot. Find your place. We'll see God do great things. Number eight. We have to be intentional with the gospel message, with the mission, with the message. If you look at in the book of Acts, these people realized they had been called to be light and salt. It just came spontaneously as a result of them surrendering their lives to Jesus as a Lord and being filled with the Holy Spirit. They understood when Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, all men, preach the gospel to all creatures. 
God's idea wasn't just to start a movement in Jerusalem and just have it grow there and be there and stop there. He made it very clear from the beginning. It's going to go great here, but I want you to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. Take the message. In fact, it seems as though there's a moment where they're not doing it in the history of the church. And then all this persecution comes, and it kind of causes this, this, this mass exodus out of Jerusalem. And what happens is when they leave Jerusalem, they begin to take the message with them wherever they went. Sometimes we have to get a little pressure going on in our lives before we actually start getting the message out. The tragedy would be that I would ever stand before God and realize, and, and I was in difficult situations in my life, and all I did while I was there was just complaining about it instead of realizing God was trying to tell me something. God was trying to do something. And I'm looking at all that, well, I must have to do this. It may mean this or it may mean that. could mean I just need to get on fire for Jesus, you know, and bloom where I'm planted. You know, just wherever God sent me, that's what I'll do. And I'll put out fruit and be, live the way God's called me to live and be what God's called me. We have to be intentional. We say, what do you mean? That means tomorrow morning when I get out of bed, I put my feet on the ground, I realize God wants to use me today. That means tomorrow when I step out of my bed, you know, get dressed, look myself in the mirror, I look myself and say, God wants to use you today. What are you going to do? Be open. Have your ears. Pay attention. Be, be sensitive. All around me, God's going to bring some people across my path and across your path who are in need, who need to hear the message of life and truth. God wants us to be light. God wants us to be salt. There's two things, you know, those two things are, are impacting things. Light and salt. They, they, they like penetrate. Light penetrates the dark. Salt, when it's seasoning things, it penetrates the meat or whatever it's placed on. It's, it's like a, a doorknob that has a key slot. That key penetrates that knob and it penetrates that door and it opens the door. It's like our lives, our lives have to be inserted into people's lives. And that's a willful decision I make to not be quiet anymore or not to shut up, but to be open to the Holy Spirit that when he tells me, speak to that individual, say this or do this or help there, then I do that. And it literally penetrates in that situation. That's what we're to do in the culture that we're in. I mean, what good is the salt shaker if it stays, I mean, the salt if it stays in the shaker? And so what's happening in church? What good are we doing if all we do is sit here and fellowship in the salt shaker? No good. The Bible says it's good for nothing. It's to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. We're just kind of sitting around, fellowshipping. There's this reversal that has to, to take place where we step out of our little shells I really believe that anybody can be one to Christ. You say, what's the key to that? I think it's really just a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. God's going to, if God's burdening me with people's lives, he's certainly going to give me that key. Especially if there's someone I have a real hard, heavy burden for, I can ask God, God, what is, what is it I can say to this person? What, what can I, is it something I need to do for this person or say? Well, what is it? I believe God will, God will give you a word. Can y'all snap your fingers, y'all, to do that? You know, it took a little while for somebody to learn it, but you got it down. Snap your fingers with me. Here, do it again, together. Every time, keep going, you snap your fingers, two people just died and went to hell. That breaks my heart. 176,000 people will die in the next 24 hours. That should motivate us. As a church, knowing what we've been given and what is ours and what is at our disposal and what we have, most of those people that will die in these 24 hours will go into eternity without Jesus Christ. And we're content to sit in church and just hear the gospel over and over. I, I forgot who it was, Billy Graham, or whoever says, does anybody have a right to hear the gospel twice until everybody's heard it at least once? It ought to be in our heart. Everything we're doing in our ministries, bottom line is make disciples. Make disciples. Whether it's in youth ministry, children's ministry, lift ministry, men's ministry, women's ministry, food ministry, clothing pantries, all the other ministries that we could go down the line and list, hospitality ministries and benevolence ministries, everything really boils back down to that. Love people, love God. And if we love God and we love people, we'll make some disciples. And we'll see, it says, and the Lord will add to our number as well. So it's about honoring him and fulfilling the mission. Let me just read that one time. Rely on the Holy Spirit. Love people. Embrace the biblical model, God's will, God's way. Realize how big God is. 
Believe in the power of prayer. Be generous. Discover your ministry and be intentional about your life. I hope you carry that out of here with you. If all you carry out is say, well, I don't agree with Joe about that, or I don't know if I agree with Joe about that, or I don't like his illustration on that, then you miss the mark. You missed it completely. This is all about us being God's people and God's family. And I could guarantee you, if I'm wrong about something, God has a way of fixing me as well as he does you. Amen? Amen. I wish I could say I was 100% right. I only know one person like that. Y'all know his name, right? <laughs> Amen. Let's look at this year as an opportunity to be something for God we've never been before. To take it one step deeper than what we've tread in before. To go one bit farther than what we've ever experienced in our Christian life before. To trust God for a little more than what we've ever trusted him for. To give a little more than we've ever given. To be a little more than we've ever been. Amen. Let's be challenged by the days that are ahead of us. There's some dismal reports out in the church. Let's just make sure it's not our church. We can't do anything about those others, amen? amen. We can do something about ours. Yes. Let's be faithful. Let's be excited about what God's doing. Let's be excited about what God's let us be a part of. I am. I'm thrilled. I'm excited about the opportunities that are before us. And like I say, I'll share with you in the days to come some things that we believe God wants us to be and do this year. Let's stand with our heads bowed. This morning could well be you came in as a guest and as a visitor and you don't even know the Lord. I encourage you, it's not church membership you need, it's Jesus membership. You need to give your heart and your life to Christ. God loves you so much, he sent his own son to die for you. He raised him up from the dead on the third day and has given the power to forgive all your sins. Stands ready because of what he's done. Can't work for it, you can't deserve it, you can't earn it. It's a gift of grace. And I'd encourage you today to surrender your heart and your life to Jesus Christ right there where you're standing. Ask him to come in and save you. For every Christian in this room, my prayer is that this, ch this message has been a challenge. It has for me. Just preparing it over the last couple of weeks has been a, 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 a challenge for me. To renew and stir my own personal fervor and passion for the gospel and what God can do in our lives. Maybe you just need to come and find a place to pray this day and say, Lord, just revive me, renew me, restore me. If you're here without Jesus, first and foremost, come. Let one of these men know, I'm going to give my life to Christ. If you're a member here, why don't you come find a place to pray this morning? Ask God to give you a fresh vision. Pour up fresh oil upon your life. Make yourself available to him. He's still moving in this world. His church still matters. We still matter. Let's let God do in us what he wants to do in us. Some other need you want us just to pray with you or pray about or want to bring somebody to the altar with you to pray, you come. Let's open ourselves up to the Lord and let's be sensitive to what he's leading. As we worship and as we sing this song, come. Let's surrender to the Lord.